Good afternoon. Can you all hear? Yes. Good. I suspect all of you have probably at some time or another been to Singapore, and I wonder if you've shared the same experience I have had going to Singapore, which is that every time I go to Singapore and I go into a building, I freeze. And that's because Singapore is the most over-air-conditioned city in the world, I think, an unfortunate legacy of the uh, otherwise fantastic founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, today's presentation by our uh, speaker, Ajahn Widodo, is going to show how Singapore is beginning to change and to recover the wisdom of uh, Singapore's ancestors in how to live without uh, air conditioning. Ajahn Widodo is born and raised in Indonesia but has been teaching at National University of Singapore for many years and is um, now a Singapore citizen. He, um, in addition to teaching at NUS, where he heads the graduate program in architectural conservation, he is the founding father of Modern Asian Architectural Network. He is the founding director of the International Network of Tropical Architecture. He is a founding director of ECOMOS Indonesia and ECOMOS Singapore, and he's a senior advisor to the Southeast Asian Cultural Heritage Alliance, or SICHA, which some of you may know uh, conducted a three-day se seminar on cultural wisdom for climate action here at the Siam Society last month, as a result of which the Siam Society has been invited to uh, partner with the Petro National Trust of Jordan in leading up the cultural action side of COP28 in Dubai at the end of the year. Uh, Dr. Widodo um, did his undergraduate work in Indonesia in Bandung. Then he went on to get a Master of Architectural Engineering from Katholika University in Leuven, Belgium, and a PhD in Architecture from the University of Tokyo. After Dr. Widodo's uh, presentation is finished, we'll invite two Thai professors of architecture to come up and join in uh, a sort of a talk show with uh, Professor Widodo to discuss the uh, uh, building that um, Dr. Widodo will be presenting here and how this sort of program might move forward here in Thailand. The first of the two Ajahn is uh, Professor At Setabut, uh, who is Associate Professor of Architecture at Jula Longkorn. Uh, Professor At did his undergraduate at Jula. He then got an MA, a, a, a master's degree in building technology at the Georgia University of Tech, or Georgia Institute of Technology, and a PhD in architecture at Texas A&M University, both in the US. His interests are in particular in green building and ecological buildings, green building management, and energy management. He's spearheaded a number of projects over the last year, the most recent of which in 2021 was networking activities for promotion of passive, low energy residential buildings in the tropics, the case of Thailand. And um, the second uh, professor is Ajahn Winyu Atreksa, professor at Thomasat, who teaches urban design, architecture, and integrated science of built environment. He did his undergraduate in Silipagon, and then went on to get a master's in architecture and urbanism at the Delft University in the Netherlands and finished up with a PhD from the School of Architecture in London. So at this point, I'd like to turn over the microphone to Dr. Widodo. Please welcome him. Thank you, James. And also thank you to everyone who spent this uh, Saturday afternoon. Yeah, uh, rather than going into the traffic jam, it's better to enjoy uh, this afternoon uh, cool aircon here. But I will start with, uh, you know, I feel a bit guilty uh, here because I'm talking about sustainable architecture in the most unsustainable room. <laughs> it's better to talk under the, the tree and uh, come hang house uh, sitting on the floor. But it's okay, no worries, because 
my, my topic here is, um, is about uh, a building, a brand new building, about five years ago. But I will start from the climate crisis, uh, global heating. It's not just global warming, right? Because what we see uh, right now is the impact of, the, uh, of this climate change is, is very devastating. And it's related directly to both economic and environmental issues. It's directly related to human behavior and ethics. And why uh, National University of Singapore is trying to, to use this first building is because we are academic institutions. So if we don't walk the talk, we are committing crimes. And we lost uh, authorities, moral authority to teach. When our curriculum says, now you have to design a sustainable building, but the students have to struggle in unhealthy, sick building with the central aircon system, they always get flu. If one student gets flu, everybody will get flu. In that kind of environment, we don't walk the talk and we, we lose our moral authority as teachers. And that's the reasons why we should start to do something different. So I think the, the basic uh, uh, philosophy here, the necessary behavioral change is from the attitude of what we want into the attitude of what we need from consumptive to productive, from destroying to caring. And this is, uh, it's not just a repentance, but it's a totally uh, against the so-called the consumerism culture that we are experiencing now. And we thought, um, I think since the re industrial revolutions, we always teach our children and pamper them with gadgets, with, uh, to make them happy. Yeah, you, you are, you are, your parents live in a very difficult situation. Now it's time for you to enjoy. So as a parent, actually, we are shortchanged our students, our children, because our children become weak. They never know the, the beauty of sitting on the terrace because they just play with a the gadget. Their iPhone 13 is still working well, iPhone 8 is still working well, but now because there's iPhone 13, 14, then you want to please your kids by giving them iPhone 14. And this is something that consumerism, extreme consumerism, actually is a, a suicidal move towards uh, killing our Earth. So if you look into the, the situations, the so-called uh, in the geographical lessons a uh, long time ago, when I was uh, in primary, secondary schools and JC, we always told that tropical region is between second degrees, degrees, 23 degrees to 20 degrees north and south. It seems like it's very static. And then you have the subtropic and then temperate and then uh, uh, poles. Eh? But actually, if you look into the, the, the pattern of the orange and red, it's pulsating. And now even the so-called the, the, the ping uh, can reach as to New Zealand, to Perth, and even to Tokyo in Japan. So that's why you can find this is an extreme weather. And it's getting worse because of the carbon emissions. We, we uh, destroy our ozones. Uh, and uh, the case of uh, skin cancer also getting uh, more and more. And the second picture is showing the the design property of uh, design life of a building. Design life yeah. is, uh, will, uh, and, and is directly related to the performance. A long time, of course, the performance will be dropped because technology changed, because the building is crumbling, utility is crumbling. But we can do refurbishment or rejuvenations. Yeah. And by doing this refurbishment, we extend the design life. And then, of course, it's shorter than the beginning one because we, we, the, the concrete is getting older, the wood is getting older, infrastructure is getting older, but at least you can perform something more. If we do some uh, retrofitting, refurbishment again, though, it can extend. So basically, we can extend this as much as we can. 
by not losing so much performance, still acceptable performance. What I want to say is, if the Roman used concrete to build aqueduct and colosseums, they used concrete, and that can stand for 2,000 years, why we demolishing our concrete building? Because it's only reached 99 years lease. Why can't the, the so-called the tenure of the building is extended to 100 or 200 years? Depends on the material. Brick. See, in Ayutthaya, that bricks. How long has it been there? It's called Thai. How long has that brick has been there? When you created brick, you burn so much energy. Brick carbon footprint is higher than concrete. So don't say that brick is actually sustainable. It's not sustainable. But because we retain the brick and not demolishing it, not throw it into the sea, then actually we preserve more carbon content. So that is the, 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 the mindset. So the existing structure is really something that we need to pay attention with. It's not really, that's why we, I, I set up a conservation program. The reason for conservation is not nostalgia. If we start the conservation program based on significance, cultural, social, there is no money there. And you cannot convince private sectors to conserve. No money, no honey. So if you want honey, then show the money. And show the money is in the existing structure, embodied carbon. And that carbon has monetary value now. We can do carbon trading. We can get incentive. And the incentive can be cash. In Singapore, if your building is kept, and if you are building the new building, achieving the, the so-called the green mark platinum of net zero, the government will straight away give you $600,000 money to the owner. And second, if you produce more energy and waste less carbon, you will be additional 10% or 20% GFA, gross floor area. And that means money. right? So this has to be translated into this, and of course, we need to also uh, change the outdated building codes, outdated system, and whatever. You know, all the system will come together as one things. So Singapore has been very much uh, progressing because since independence, uh, not independence actually, we never been independence. We are kicked out from Malaysia in 1965. Why? Because when uh, because well, the small islands. 5.5 uh, 5 million people now, you know, it's 600, uh, 700 something, 800 square kilometers. We can't survive, we couldn't survive, like when you thought that time, without uh, aligning ourselves with a bigger country like Malaysia. But then, because of the racial tension, riots, and so on, so in 1965, Singapore has decided to kick out, to move out from Malaysia. So that's why we have National Day, not Independence Day. <laughs> And the first thing that the one you say at that time is, well, if you don't not able to take care of even a single trees, don't even talk about how to taking care of the whole nations. So it's where he started the, the tree planting movement. And they give incentive, give carrot, show the money. If you plant more than what you need, then I'll give you incentive. But if you cut one tree, you have to replace by five trees or go to jail. Right? It's very straightforward, or fine, or whatever. Singapore is a fine city. Everything will be fine. <laughs> if you don't flush your toilet, you don't fly across the road, jaywalking, well, it's revenue from the government. But at the same time, also to teach the government, to, uh, the, the citizen to do that. But now, uh, after that, the URA, Urban Redevelopment Authority, developed the first master plan based on Garden City concept, greening of Singapore. And a few years later, it changed into City in the Garden and give more authority to national parks to take care of the entire island instead of just botanical garden. And then lock botanical garden to UNESCO World Heritage Sites. 
Why? Because it's to push Singapore. Now, our, the only UNESCO World Heritage Site is Botanical Garden. So if we cannot take care of the entire island and show the entire world that the entire island of Singapore is, is aligned with the submissions, then it's shaming ourselves. Then the policy changed again. So the latest policy and the latest master plan based on the idea of city in nature. And by city in nature, we are forced to take to adopt you know, the concept of rewilding the city. So when you choose plants, it should not be imported plants, but native plants. Because native plants is zero maintenance cost, almost zero. And second, it is more resilience, and then help to develop the returning the biodiversity into the city. And this is very seriously implemented. And then in, the, in terms of plan, because Singapore has pledged to achieve 17 SDG, like all the nations are member of UN, by 2030. So we have this called SG Green Plan 2030. 2030 is seven years from now. It's very short. But the, there is a commitment. Number one is city in nature, right? So this commitment. A green, livable, and sustainable home for Singaporeans. at 1,000 hectares of green space and 100 kilometers of park connectors. Every household will live within 10 minutes walk from the park. Plant 1 million more trees across Singapore 2030. So this is the KPI set out by the government themselves. If they cannot fulfill this, the government will suffer because the people doesn't trust the government. If the opposition use this during the next elections, PAP can lose maybe the vote. So I think Singapore is very sadomasochist kind of types, right? So we impose a very high KPI and you work very hard. It's called the kiasuism. The more kiasu is Hokkien terms for afraid to lose, then we'll be in trouble. So I always told um, my students what Singapore is look like. Singapore is like a bicycle with two wheels. Not like other countries, like four wheels or six wheels or full wheel drive. It's bicycle because we have no resources. Everything has to be imported. So you have to pedal your bicycle faster and faster. So this is the curse of Singaporeans. If you don't pedal faster and faster, your neighbors will go ahead faster than you. You cannot afford to make, make a mistake. If there is a crack on the road and you cannot avoid that crack, you fell down, you go back to third world status in overnight. That's what Lee Kuan Yew said. Don't ask about American democracy. I can you give you American democracy, but look around you. Look into Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar. Singapore will go back into that kind of situation in overnight if you don't have this responsibility. Okay, so this is the, the, the situation. And second is sustainable living. Strengthen green and fought in schools, education, number one. Green communities, commutes, 70% of all trips has to be used mass public transport. And 64% today, so it's just increased a few minutes. Triple cycling path network by 1,320 kilometers and 2030 from 462 in 2020, and green citizenry, less waste and consumption by numbers. So this is a political pledge. Energy reset, cleaner energy vehicles, sustainable fuels, greener infrastructure and building, sustainable town and district, and green energy. Now we are moving from the fossil energy to hydrogen. Electricity is from solar panel, but solar panel never been enough to fulfill this one. We already purchased electricity from Laos, and we pay Thailand and Malaysia the infrastructural cost to transfer the hydro power from Laos to Singapore. And there is a contract with the Australian company, because Australia has so big deserts, so they, they can produce a lot of energy from solar panel, and they are willing to build in, uh, under, the, under the sea cable from Perth to Singapore, passing through Indonesia. But I just heard that that company is going bankrupt last month. They don't, well, it's just a good idea. But yeah, hydrogen is easier to transfer, it's much more safer. But I think the most important thing about energy is to reduce the use of energy. 
Because if you said, if you just, you know, human never been satisfied if you just want to consume more and more. And then resilient future. Safeguarding our coastline against rising sea level, five billion for drainage and flood protections. Safeguarding food security, edible garden. So it's not just green roof on there, but it's edible roof. So if you go to Park Royal Hotel in Chinatown, Singapore, the, the, the chef always go every morning into the roof because they harvest their own herbs and some of the you know, use on, on, from the roof itself. It's very small, small scale, but the entire campus of uh, NUS, for example, um, the initiative of landscape architecture students, they start to plant edible food in between the, the buildings. So the idea is every canteen in campus have to use that 50%, 60% of the vegetables needs from their own uh, soil. And keeping Singapore cool means moderate the rise in urban heat with cool paint and increasing greenery. So this is something that is from the political side, have to have a political will. If there is no political will, there is no incentive. There is no use to, do, to use this. So it's important to convince the government. So this is just a, a few examples about the, the, the concept that is translated into practical things. So Singapore have to deal with so the water security. So just close the water, water loop. So you can calculate, make a spreadsheet and simulations how much water that you need, how much water you can get supply from Malaysia. What happened in Malaysia, cut the pipes or increase the price 100 times. The contract will end in less than 30 years. So what happened? So you have to produce water from just not for rain, but also for, from uh, new water and also from sea desalination and so on. So once you have the calculator right, just make a policy to achieve this one. Now it's almost, uh, I think 60% uh, is, 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 is being achieved because not a single drop of water is being wasted. All rivers coming into the sea is all dammed. So most of the water is from the rainwater is retained within the island. And second, the boat in Singapore River for tourists, last time they were allowed to use diesel. Now, no, because diesel will pollute our drinking water. Have to be used to a solar panel. Uh, that kind of, uh, uh, of, of measure. And then energy security, renewable energy, super low energy, and net zero is become a national policy. But of course, this is not enough. You know? This is only able to offset maybe 10 or 20% of the electrical bill. But you still need to plug your building into the, the grid. So, okay, so this is the things that uh, we start thinking when we want to design the, the new SDE4. Actually, the so-called net zero energy building and net zero waste building is not a rocket science. It has been practiced for thousands of years with our art tester. In Bangkok, the first and the best exemplary net zero energy building has been existing in Siam society. Come hang house, that wooden house, steel house. Very cool inside. You can sleep there during the, the day because of the breeze. Is there's no electricity, there is no wind, but you can live comfortably there. Our ancestors lived for that kind of house for thousands of years, right? So the key is just to reduce the temperature relative humidity that is very high outside to drop to 40% from 10, 30, 35 degrees drop to 25 degrees. By what? By cross ventilations. And cool air is produced because of shade and because of plants. Then you have this wind. You use a pitch roof and throw this roof down and become flat and flat is, goes back to the, to the soil. And then the, the hot air will go up into a higher ceiling and use materials for wall and roof that can breathe. Not solid concrete, but breathing roof. That's why you have a roof tiles, and you have some, uh, say, like um, uh, nipa leaves and so on. So you have this uh, a very simple concept of a stilt house. This is Kamhang house. 
this is something like this, right? So or vernacular in, in Cameroon Highland in Malaysia or in Ayutthaya in courtyard. Because courtyard is uh, creating this kind of uh, air movement. This is in Pegu. I was there a long time ago when I met Momo 2002, right? <laughs> uh, and we went together and this is kind of wall and uh, porous very very shady here you know we use this up down floor and this is an architectural typology and language that is not called super high technology this is smart building built by smart people it's not depending to sensors it's not depending to 5g not depending to electricity it's smart because it's cheap it's affordable and livable and zero carbon why can we do this now of course nowadays it's very difficult to have this especially if you have a campus office building hotels how how can we achieve that we also learn from this urban regeneration and modernization process in singapore this is 1930s so that time it used to be a shop houses old shop houses but the british government decided to regenerate this area by demolishing the shop houses and build this apartment so this is not shop houses this is modern apartment for the custom officers and it's uh, by singapore improvement trust of that time and you just to see the typology you see this jack roof is actually used to increase the air circulation within and the the, the window is all louvered window so you have very nice cross ventilations stack effect because hot air will go up and cool air will come from below so if you have this vertical circulation plus cross horizontal circulations crossing through your body what you feel is cool <laughs> it's not hot without aircon and second move all the say like toilet uh, everything and and kitchen to the back lane yeah. so the so-called this courtyard the opening of courtyard it's not just for aesthetic but this is really is a Corbusier the machines to live in. The machines that is, is, is the passive design, passive solar architecture. That is the answer. Then, of course, tropical modernity. This is an example of a marketplace designed by the Dutch Indonesian architects Thomas Karsten in, in Semarang. It used this language where using concrete, but cross ventilation with flat roof and so on and you create it's a very space that very rich in ambience and this is you see this this mushroom kind of uh, column this one is older than uh, Frank Lloyd Wright the mushroom building in Johnson and Johnson building I don't know whether Frank Lloyd Wright learned from his but this is just a very simple solutions following the vernacular architecture so modern architectures that, that, that copy the traditional ty uh, typology vernacular typology is not new So this SCE Net Zero Energy Building, Net Zero Energy Building is because before we built this building, yeah, this is the first newly built Net Zero Energy certified building through Green Mark in Singapore and Southeast Asia. The first university building in the world and the first building in Singapore that received the International Well Building Institute Standard 2019 as a gold the first and was called one of the world's six most beautiful buildings that redefined sustainable architecture in architecture in 2002 okay but i think most important is this one we don't believe in green mark why because it's just spreadsheet you just fill in the numbers get certified even the building is not built yet but it's a good start because this is the standard adopted by building construction authority in singapore if your calculations before you build is already achieving net zero and platinum then it give you 600,000 I give you additional GFA uh, based on that but as an academic institution we say okay this is just like our students in the final grade studio showing all these graphics without proof right so we want don't want to do that we want to walk the talk now 
So that's why we adopt this well-building standard, because well-building standard base the evaluation on the existing building and have to be evaluated every year. Have to prove that your air particles in your air and the harmful chemical is lower than national standard. That people never fall sick. Yeah? So there's a, a set of uh, new criteria added into this. Then we start to do the say, calculations. Of course, there's a solar panel, but the size of the solar panel area, if you put it in a normal use like this building, it could be three to four times bigger, where there is no space to put that solar panel. So you have to reduce the size of solar panel area to one fourth of the normal use. It means the electricity is, that is being produced is only one fourth. It means you have to reduce the electricity used within the building by three fourths, by 75 percent, to achieve net zero. Okay, if not, it's not, it's not net zero. The calculation, it's no brainy one. Okay, so the building built in 2020, so it's five years, uh, three years now. And in reality, the energy positive. This is really an energy positive building. Because in reality, although we produce only one fourth of the required energy as a, for, for normal living, we are energy positive by 30, 10 to 30 percent. So we can export energy. And it's a very low maintenance cost. And this building part of the National Water Resilient Endeavor. I will explain about this. Promoting natural biophilia providing better human health, and advocating change in mindset. Mindset is important because it's an educational building to educate the next generation of architects. So every year we produce around 100, 120 new architects. And these new architects, maybe only 10 or 20% work as a consultant. But the rest, they will work in the real estate sector, some of them in politics, some of them in trade, and become business and so on. So we can influence so many stakeholders. So we appointed an architect, design architects, because we cannot design our own building. It's conflict of interest in Singapore. So we have to open a tender. So the winner is the Seri and Multiply, Chris Lee. Uh, as one of the uh, uh, chosen as the con uh, contractors. And then we have the architect, MA engineer, and civil engineer, quantity surveyor as Urbana Jurong. But this is the most important time. The Transolar from Germany as the energy consultant, because we really want to do things for energy. So this is very important. This is for the aesthetics. This is for the, the more uh, technical of architecture and engineering and structural. And this is for the energy. So we work together and we play and act as a very difficult client, nagging, 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 you know. But lucky they are stay in the project. And, okay. So this one, where is the vernacular feature? One is very simple. Orientate the building towards the south. Why? Because you captured the wind from the sea, because you are facing the Singapore Straits on the hill. The hill is behind you, the water is in front of you. This is Feng Shui, right? The Feng Shui is that principle. And the most difficult uh, side is east and west, because you face a very hot morning and afternoon sun. So block the light from east and west. Then second is you must have a very overhanging roof to give this shadow protection, because the wind will come from these directions. And then make floating boxes. It means it's porous, cross ventilations. And vertical hole here, like courtyard. So you mix the air here, movement, but every part of the buildings can breathe, just like in a ventricular house. We are very lucky because after this, luck, uh, the COVID came. It's locked down. And a lot of building is unhealthy because people are afraid to stay in an enclosed building and air con. But we claim now because this is the first COVID ready building. We are ready for the next wave of infections. Why? Because it's all fresh air. And then innovative hybrid cooling system, 
photovoltaic cell, 1,000-2,025. And then air conditioning is used only when needed. Because as most, the conference can be open in light natural breezes. And if there is no movement, the fan will stop. So we add fan. And this is the well building standard that is being adopted. First is the air. Quality standard, including filtration, cleaning protocols, microbe controls, and material safety. Water. Testing and monitoring to control public water additives and system contaminants. Nourishment. Promotion of healthy food options. Nutrition labeling, safe food preparation and sourcing. So there is a space for canteen, for cafe. So the cafe should serve organic food. No organic food. I, I don't like that food because it's so healthy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I call it a girl's food. Why? It's just it's for bird food. It's for bird because there's a lot of um, you know uh, veggies and so on. Light. Glare free and uh, lighting design effect of surface and contrast, light quality, dye lighting and fitness, active design, enhanced ergonomic, activity incentive and structured fitness program, comfort and mind. Yeah? Mindset is important. So this building standard is evaluated every year, much higher than the national standard, and you have to set up this as, uh, to achieve to challenge yourself. So first is wellness. What to do wellness? We do a separate building mass. Healthy working environment requires access to daylight, fuse, and natural ventilation. You don't feel enclosed. You can see the trees. You can see the sky. So it's mental health. As a standard deep plan office layout makes this requirement difficult. So you cannot have a very deep office. You have very shallow. So therefore, breaks down the building massing into smaller volumes. And these volumes give students and faculty more immediate access to the light and natural ventilation of the outside, the closeness. So that's why a traditional building, tranquil building, is never fat. It's very thin. So this is the basic programming value, break down into this. Educational model, informal learning. Education requires interaction and collaboration between student and staff. And towards the end, a grand staircase forms the social heart of the educational community. What I mean by grand is not like ceremonial grand opera, but a straight staircase that designed as a sexy staircase that forced people to use staircase. And we hide all elevators. The lift is inside the fire escape. When you arrive in the booth entrance, what you see is the very sexy design of stairs. Of course, if you are on wheelchair, you can find some way to reach the hidden uh, uh, staircase. And why the reason why we, we, we don't expose that, that lift? Because it's energy. So and discourage people to use the lift. Less use of energy for lift by hiding it. And we choose the cheapest, slowest lift in the world to annoy students. <laughs> so they prefer, OK, it's faster just to climb and run. Right? And it works. It works. This educational learning. Educational doesn't mean it's about teaching space, but educational in terms of, of changing mindset. Uh, it's where students and staff meet and share ideas. Secondly, its level is wrapped on three sides with outdoor terrace, the terrace or breakout space that allows the work of the students to spill into the outdoors. So encourage them to walk in the terrace, to interact, to have lunch together in the terrace. Yeah? And then flexibility. The building must be flexible, achieved by placing an open plan level in the middle of the building sections. The central study platform accommodates the core study areas they will be configured in any way required. It means that if the concrete building can stay for 100 or 200 years, then functions may change every 20 years or 10 years. So therefore, you cannot have a fixed rooms. So the most perfect arrangement and structure is still house structure <laughs> without any assigned space. So do you design the frame, not the box? And within that frame, you can change the configurations anytime when the functional change is needed. So that's the principles where you need to have this very flexible uh, arrangement. And then community, activating grounds and terraces. Different levels are dedicated to communal spaces. The level include the front garden, exhibition space within the social plaza for display of student work, visiting exhibition, and different green terrace to provide pleasant outdoors working environment. So encourage people to work outdoor. 
in Southeast Asia in the tropics, the living room, the playground is on the street. In Bangkok, you eat on the pedestrian walk. You cannot force them to clean up the street like several years ago. <laughs> they come back to the street. In Vietnam, you still even sit on the ground, enjoy coffee, whatever. So, and this is uh, try to be repeated there. And then living laboratory. We call it a research-based facade. The proposal consists the building itself a laboratory. Both sides of the facade, part of the facade, can be used for you know, one-to-one -one models to test the performance of the facade. You know, I will show you how. Yeah? So, and this is still tucked to the power grid, energy reduction strategies. Yeah? Uh, we produce limited amount of electricity from the roof. East and west is blocked. You create a wind tunnel effect here to cool the wall. Cross ventilation here. Use a hybrid aircon system inside. And then uh, we connect the aircon with the existing chiller plan. So we don't build new chiller. Why? Because it's only 28 degrees. So it's very little. This is the tropical architecture principles. Facing south, breakdown. Uh, projected roof and solar screen. Not a rocket science. Level one, very small. Level two, you see all this, uh, uh, the main floor is coming from there. What you when you come from here, what you see is the staircase and the, the court and, and this one. This is the, the, the so-called the double wall, double wall facing east and west. So the wind will go through here from hot to, to cool area, cool to hot area. There is a drag effect here, another wind tunnel effect happening here and also here. Yeah, so okay, don't worry about that. So it's, I think the most important section is the show is this one. So you see all this uh, vertical courtyard and cross ventilations going all over the place, like this one. It's very porous, very porous. And the most difficult construction actually is this sleek column. Well, when during the tender, we have to follow the Singapore regulation and the US regulation. The cheapest contractor, and there must be at least three bidder. And the cheapest actually cannot achieve this because they are, sorry, it's coming from China and they offer a very cheap price. The most expensive is the local because everything has to be, you know. But the second cheapest is Japanese, Kajima. And Japanese are very good in making this. So only Japanese can do this. <laughs> very slick one. And it's not the cheapest. And we need about a year to convince the university administrations to allow us to take the second cheapest, not the cheapest one. And after the project finished, suddenly, because Kajima so, feels so happy with the performance of the building, very positive portfolio for them, they offer us three PhD scholarships. Right? For any students who are really working on this, and they can work um, uh, in their uh, laboratory in Tokyo. So at the end of the day, it's the cheapest one. Because if you have this benefit of 3 PA digital scholarship, it's not cheap. You know? and, and this is something that um, uh, maybe can help to convince the university administrator later uh, that performance is more important rather than the, the, the cheapest bit. So this is, I just show you uh, of the, the, the upper floor. This is the sixth floor. And we give this studio on the sixth floor for year one students. Because students cannot complain. Now can you sleep? Now it's a fan over there. So this building is not normal. So we put year one students there because we want to change the mindset since the very beginning. Before they are too late. And they just come from junior college, coming to university. They don't dare to protest. <laughs> it's like pushing the, our kids into the swimming pool. Because you cannot teach the, our, our kids to swim just by asking them to watch YouTube. You have to push them really into the cold water and struggle. Then they will convince and enjoy that swimming is nice, it's cool. So they buy this idea, and then when they have lunch or whatever, they just go out here and play, and they see multi-million dollars 
million dollars few, they are only able to be enjoyed by people in the high and expensive condominiums. Because you can see Malacca Straits, you can see Indonesia, Batam Island from that floor. Yeah, so it makes them fall in love into this. And of course the design is so sleek, it's very cool, minimalist. Yeah, this is the, uh, that is my office, my office is this one, this corner. Yeah, and this is the double wall. There's a creepers going up by itself. No cabling, no pots, no pipes, no electricity. Zero cost green wall. Because creepers in tropical climate can go up as high as this, as the temple, as the top of uh, uh, Angkor Wat. And, okay. So this is the, the double wall facing south. This is the projected roof. That is my office. That's my table. Behind the screen is my Nespresso machine. Yeah, yeah, Nespresso machine here. Yeah. And then there's a tree. So the, during the construction of this place, uh, not a single tree was cut following Lee Kuan Yew because although he's passed away, I think his spirit is still watching over us. So we're afraid to cut any trees. The contractor complained. It's so difficult to maintain the safety of these trees. We don't care. We don't pay you. If you kill this and you pay the fine. Okay? So they died. I have to preserve this. So these trees is being preserved. All these are being preserved. So we have a very nice, I don't know, the building is embracing the trees. So, um, so this is also function as a wind scoop and embracing the nature. Yeah, it's from the, in front, from the front, you can see all these holes and the pillars. Just like a still house in Myanmar, still house in uh, Sukhothai. Yeah? Vernacular architecture, still structure, porous building mass, and cross ventilations. This is from above. See, that creepers is helping us to protect against western sun in the afternoon. This is my uh, library book. Why I put this here? Because it's a small detail, it's a mistake. In this theater, that side is glass. So when the students sit here, especially the girls, people from my studio will stare into their glass. <laughs> right? Especially if you're wearing skirt. So that's why I don't want that to happen. So it's, it's, it's a small mistake uh, because it's all glass on the other side. So I just put this rack and put book there and solve. Yeah? And it's become very Instagrammable here. Uh, and the fan. So the fan will turn whenever it's uh, hot. If not, then it will not turn. And you see this screen? It's just by a push of button, they will drop during the storm. So to make the room wet. But also, this is also very functionally interesting because the open space here can turn into 200 people capacity auditorium by dropping the screen and it's dark enough to do the screen projections. So you have a very flexible things. And then everything is exposed. And because it's too high, it doesn't fulfill the fire regulation because this sprinkle is only work for a certain height. But because we also have possibility to use this for 200 people, the fire department said, no, you must have something by lowering your ceiling. And we said, no, we want this. So then, okay, now we will install. Later, I will show you this, the corner. Four water gun. So when there's a fire and smoke, that gun will detect and shush, flooded the area with water. It never been implemented anywhere in Singapore. But because we are academic building, we consider this as a laboratory test case. So the fire department give us the benefit of the doubt. Yes, you can implement that. And we will take note. And because we are successfully implemented this during the exercise, they are satisfied. Now they're changing the building code, the fire code. So it means that as an academic building, we are in the forefront to change law, to change regulations, in the pretext of we are doing experiments. You cannot, private sectors cannot do this. Only the academic building can do this. Yeah, so this is the retractable screen. Retractable. It's very cheap because you just use a steel cable there. And then uh, this is, we call it a rain screen. Yeah, just open this lock and then press the button. It will drop and going and up. Low cost. Then, soji door. 
our Japanese contractor say, hey, why don't you put this, you know, whiteboard and then pinboard and door, Japanese style. Okay, just implement this. They are happy, we are happy. Because why? Oh, now we can put the, our Japanese signature to your building. <laughs> and ventilations, yeah, this is a, a composite aluminium, very porous. And because it's composite, so when it's exposed to the sun, east and west, it's not getting hot. So it's not dangerous when you touch this because it's so low. And second, it will not kill creepers because it's cool. Yeah? Uh, and then this is the, the nostril. Yeah? The, it's, it's not aesthetic, not just aesthetic, but it's an opening, a gap between the, the, the f window frame and inside there's a filter, like human nostrils for breathing, because if you have fan inside, the temperature, the temperature is going down, but the pressure is getting high, so the pressure will push the air from inside out automatically. And this is the vertical ventilation, going up, going up, going up, going up. This is the Chinese courtyard, vernacular courtyard, stack effect. And you have this uh, opening here to push the hot air out immediately. So hybrid cooling system basically is just you have the input and output, fresh air, ceiling fans, and then uh, lighting and so on. So we have these uh, simulations for the hybrid cooling system that enable us to reduce the electricity for the same level of comfort by 30% electricity consumption. Yeah, so it's 60% uh, the humidity. This is achieved by this, by circulations. And we tested that the, the fan here, the speed, and also the design of the fan, thanks to the energy consultants, will not disturb the paper on the table level. And it will not create a headache. But if you stand, your head will be a bit you know, too strong on your head. But if you sit down, then it feels very comfortable. It's for the student not to loiter around. <laughs> Sit down, work, <laughs> and you feel comfort. Very Singaporean, right? <laughs> uh, and this sailing actually helped as a acoustic, but also to keep the, the height. So the, the hot air will hovering around there and cheaper. Uh, but also help to diffuse the wind directions. So the fan will move whenever there is a movement. So if you stay idle, sleeping, the fan will stop. So it forces you to dance like monkey. Exercise, exercise, jump, move your hand. The light also will turn off. So the sensor is used to turn off the lamp and the fan to reduce energy. But second, to keep the people moving. This is the high ceiling or acoustic wind diffuser LED, LED lighting is integrated with this frame and also the sensors. Yeah, so this is the... the uh, yeah. And then biophilia. Biophilia is falling in love again into the nature and the result is something like this. P students playing with water gun. Because it's, it's helped to, to clean this one and it's okay to spray water. And then they start to fall in love into this nature. If you see the three canopy over there in front of the studio like this, and then there's a tree that is embraced by the building, the greenery helps. And this is what that means by the, by the city in nature. That you are living in the like in the botanical garden. And it is good you know, to keep the nature. So students, every time they saw something going for a study trip to Bangkok, to India, the first comment is, where's the trees? Why is it so dry? So we feel lonely without trees. Like Totoro, right, in Japan. <laughs> Totoro is a, is a cartoon that uh, uh, things protests against the, the, the cutting of the trees. Yeah, this is, let's say, very creepers. It goes up by itself, and the root is taking the moisture from the air for growth. And second, because of these composite materials, it's not hot, it's not kill the creepers. No, it's reaching up to the roof. So if you want to reduce some, it's very easy, just drag this from below, 
without any scaffolding and cut reduce by 50%, next time it will go up again. Zero maintenance, zero cost. You don't need any funky uh, kind of an, uh, technology to do this. And this is the lecture theater with all glass. No need to have projection screen, just project to the wall. Yeah. See, that's that, what I mean by transparency, is before I install the bookshelf on my, my studio on there. And this is the cafe, it's bankrupt because of COVID. We are looking for the new tenant. But this space also functions as an uh, enclosed exhibition room. When it still functions as a cafe, uh, they have a big table here for staff meeting. So during staff meeting, we don't want to go into the spring room, but here because they serve wine and they don't need to pay. You just charge the departments. Very simple. If you do a gathering, just gathering here. More people just use this open space. Very flexible. And this is the inside. Yeah, no need to have uh, tables. Just sit on the floor. And we provide some pillows if they want to sleep during uh, you know, empty space. And, but everything is transparent. Why? Because we want to teach them about the anti-corruptions and hanky-panky under the tables. Everything is transparent. You will be seen and to be seen. I think this is a mentally say that don't try to, to close things in the cubicles and be secretive. Don't do funny things. Because why? People are looking at you and you can see the others. Yeah, this is the, 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 the translations of the transparency in terms of, of, uh, of mental. And this is the experimental wall. So, the wall on level 6 facing east and west, and level 5 facing east and west, is retractable. So, you see, there is a lock here, lock here. So, you just open the lock, and then push this square wall behind, about a few meters, three meters. And then you can lock this again for safety. You can remove the panels and replace the panels with your mock one-to-one -one scale models for the facade. This is the first and the only architecture schools in the world that allow the student themselves, without any contractors, to do a one-to-one -one models to the building facade, and then you put sensor, everything, and do the experiment there. So every time you can see this is changing face. Yeah? That one is changing face. It's nothing. It's not no experiment, so we just put back the panels, but this is when the exper some experimental facade is being put into the actions. So it shows that the, the building itself is um, the, the expressions, external expressions, somehow gives an opportunity to show that this is a laboratory. And that can happen on that four, five meters double wall in between. This is the studio space. The cable comes from above, not from the floor. Why? Because architecture school is always have problems with cleanliness. Students tend to throw everything to the floor. Every architecture school. But in Singapore, we want to change that by implementing rules that every morning, every afternoon, evening, we will call the cleaner. Whatever on the floor will be swept, including your iPhone, including your MacBook including your models. So we provide with racks. Something that if you don't want to lose, you don't want to pick home, put it on the rack, you go home. And this studio is shared, so we don't give one stable to one student anymore. But the studio is only for one day. Thursday is for this year. Tuesday for this year. Third day is for this year. So they have to keep the tables clean. And it works. Because the, wall, the, the floor can be easily cleaned, and second is the room can be easily reprogrammable because every table has wheels and it's collapsible. Again, we come back to this flexibility. You can turn this in a few hours, in one or two hours, into exhibitions room. In another one, two hours, become a big seminar rooms, Or into the crate room or cubicle for studios. This is the ground floor as well. It's also, uh, and also the... The, the idea of the, the architects is now is also working in the shared environment, just like Google, like Facebook. No more in the cubicles or big office like last time. 
so it has to be shared space. This is the fire safety, fire access from the wall, as you saw. That is the two fire gun, uh, uh, water gun on the roof. And there is a matter to manage the pressure, so the inspector doesn't need to open the ceiling. Use handphone to zoom and see whether the meter is all right or not. Cheap way to do that. And second, of course, they are, they are not happy with this staircase. They have to be enclosed. Fine, so we do this very big you know, screen that will fall if there is a fire alarm. Here, this one. And this is the first thing that is being approved in Singapore. And that will become the game changer in the design of the fire screen for all other buildings. Hey, see that? This is during the, the exercise. See, see the, the, the movement there, the space, big space. The connections to the old buildings. And every five seconds, there is a blasted environment. There is a fire, we count, but it's very annoying, so you have to run away from your space and get out. Because otherwise, it's just thought it's a false alarm. Right? Water. So the, wa the rainwater harvesting is done with the roof. So the solar panel is put on the, uh, above the, the, the concrete. And that concrete uh, uh, is uh, become the rainwater harvesting uh, roof. And they built a 52 meter cubic rainwater harvesting tank on the upper floor for flushing toilet and irrigations. Because all water in Singapore are drinkable. Tap water, anywhere, even in the toilet. So we don't want to flush our toilet with our precious water. Use rainwater, and because of the green needs a lot of, of water, we use this rainwater as well. And also for splinker during the fire. And then there is a bioretention pond, basin area, with 180 meters, and detention volume 36 meters, and before it was controlled, discharged into the Singapore uh, entire um, uh, water circle. Yeah, so the idea is from, from the roof, catchment area, going into pond one, resin benzene, drop, 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 and then boom, boom, to create as long as possible absorption into the ground with uh, native plants. Yeah, so this. That is the first thing from the roof. If there is an uh, overflow here, it's become very, flat, very beautiful. You have this fountain of flood, but the flood will be channeled here, there, drop here, deep into three meters down, and follow the river here. And there is a small waterfall here, and then river again, well, small waterfall there, waterfall, eh? waterfall, waterfall, and finally come into this, before it being discharged into the, another retention pool down there. So the secret is to make the, the absorption as long as possible and to make the soil as soft as possible by native plants. And it works because even if you have a, a one week always rain, storm, the flood only comes into this part. This part is remains dry. Means that Singapore, we are ready to have 100 years Flooding, <laughs> because it enough to up to bring uh, to uh, put back the water into the earth just by this part. No need to use the pond two, pond three, and four. And this is the the staircase things huh? from the past top over there. What you see is this staircase bang 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 going up. It's coming from this side. You don't see the lift, but you see is this one <laughs> going up. And going up is this. It's from level 2 to level 5 and then level 6. And because uh, normally the mindset and also regulations say if you have four-story building, you have a walk-up apartment maximum to four. If it's more than four, you have to install lift. You want to get away from there. So what you see here actually is only from level 2 to level 5. means it's 1, 2, 3, 4. Yes, still fulfilling that. But you turn and you take this another staircase on the other side. So you don't break any rules, but it's difficult to find lift. And it's too far, and the lift is very slow. And for lighting, it's just enough to light your feet. You don't need to have a general lighting over there. 
at night. And then this is, of course, is for the yeah, uh, universal accessibility. Hidden lifts, yeah, hidden lift inside. This is also doubled as a cargo lift at the back. It's also hidden. This is the connections to no, the old buildings. You see, no rain protections. Why? Because if it's rain, you have to go down one floor by staircase and cross there. <laughs> and going up again to other level. And this is for the, the disabled. And then we alter the toilet, male and female, on different floor. But if you cannot you know, hold for so long, you can use the universal accessibility uh, toilet if you are male on the female floor. And there is a water filter here for drinking. And the only hot water is provided at level five, only one. So it's for you to go up and down to exercise. So it's, if I have a visitor like Jim, last time visited me, we walk up and down, there's already 5,000 steps. If I have two visitors per day, easily 10,000 steps. You don't even need to go around. <laughs> yes. Ah, OK, very quickly. Now, I just showed you the beyond net zero. Uh, the, the energy positive, yeah, energy basic is basically it able to generate five. 4,000 kilowatt hour of renewable energy while consuming only about 390. So this is the reality, the numbers surplus. And it's fluctuating from 10% to 30%. And because Singapore is not like California, not like Sweden, we cannot sell our energy. But we can use the energy to offset the needs of the next building, this special project. So that you can go to this website and click this one. This is the old building that connect to this one. So the SDE4 is here. This is SDE1. This is SDE3. And that one is SDE2. Yeah, old one. The oldest building built in the 70s. We don't demolish that one. We retrofit that one. And become and put the solar panel. Put additional facade. Because it's facing west. To cool down the facade. And then get the BCA certifications, and we got the super low energy certification platinum. So we got incentive, $500,000. And second, because we have energy surplus for all building, we channel that, and this will become net zero. And we will get money again from the government <laughs> saying, OK, we now it's become net zero. And the impact is the, the entire campus. This is the campus of office. Uh, of, of Office of Estate Development. They changed their building into a totally vernacular architecture buildings, cross ventilations. The entire old building in campus now filled with uh, solar energy. So in the next round of conservation, of, of renovation, this will become net zero. So we create this snowballing effect. And the idea is really walk the talk is number one. Socially responsible, we put human-centered and ethical in the, at the center of the design. Culturally authentic, learn from local wisdom and contextual. Third, environmentally sustainable, have to be carbon neutral, zero energy, zero waste. Economically affordable and viable, don't waste energy, choose the cheapest leaf, use a plant, native plant and so on and architectural and technology response in appropriate. So I think this is the way that we become possible to achieve these 17 SDGs. And by prioritizing the so-called the biosphere to save the Earth through the real actions, walk the talk to save our... Yeah, this is the final words. Making a modern contemporary building, which is not only sustainable and green, but also net zero aim at human wellness, is not a rocket science. Sustainability, livability, and resilience depend not on smart technology, but cultural wisdom. Like the principle of tropical vernacular architecture, human-centered design, and common sense. So that's why I think, yeah, you can do this uh, for the reading. I think that we can achieve now, uh, is this possibility. The learning point is, this is not a dream. This is not a utopian. But start with a small pilot project. 
I heard from Jim that Siam Society is about to renovate the main hall downstairs. Make it a net zero energy heritage. Why? To reflect the Kam Hang House, to create this narrative of connectivity. And you use that to send the message to more people who are coming to different talks. The only thing that is really, really need to do that is remove all this glass, put a little bit aircon taken from taking from this one, and put the fan. And maybe you do some retrofitting, hire an energy consultant, and do a mock, build the digital uh, digital twin, and use this as an academic exercise. Work together with universities, and do it. Right? So once it's done, then you can start to kick the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Widodo, for an outstanding presentation and for the challenge to the Siam Society to begin to do something similar here on our property. Now I would like to invite Ajahn At and Ajahn Winyu and Professor Widodo to if you could take the three chairs there, and we'll have a bit of a talk show here. Um, today's uh, uh, event is a joint event between the Association of Siamese Architects and the Siam Society. And so Professor Widodo is the guest of the Siam Society, and Professor Art and Professor Winyu are representing the Association of Siamese Architects and I would like to invite them to start uh, a discussion now on this presentation and how we can do this in Thailand. Please. Okay, thank you, Professor, for a very, very informative and wonderful presentation. I'm really appreciate it because uh, I teach on the tropical architecture, energy conservation, and your uh, presentation very inspiring, especially for our students. Yeah, sometimes we, we invite you to give a lecture like this in our school. Sometimes, okay, okay, uh, for you. Okay, maybe I start first. Um, well, as an um, instructor in university, we uh, teach students a lot about case study from Singapore. And I think there have been a lot of interesting cases regarding uh, contemporary tropical architecture. Um, could you uh, emphasize a little bit more about how, how this building um, fit into the um, arch architectural context of Singapore? Like, uh, what's the significance of this building? Okay, um, this is not the first uh, trial in terms of architecture. For example, if you look into the building by Woha, like the Oasia hotels, so they already use these creepers that may attract a certain types of birds and animals, and the fragrance of the flowers of that hotel. So it's become a, a kind of uh, attractions uh, by most of the visitors. To, to, to start to fall in love again, the viophilia, and there's um, uh, Park Royal Hotels with the facade and so on. And comparing to that, actually this building is the first thing that really thinking about the sustainability as the starting point. The carbon neutrality in terms of low energy and zero energy. And second is the changing of the mindset because we want to, to educate the students, the users, about the new lifestyle. Refrain from just repeating the, the status quo. But experience yourself about the possibility of uh, living differently, acting differently. Then you will be convinced that you can change the world. You can, the change is from you, not from someone else, not from the government. Well, the other buildings are mostly as not educational. And the aim is maybe it's just to reduce a little bit the el electronic bills and so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mean uh, you uh, the 
government has a regulation on this one that the school have to reduce the energy use or carbon footprint or any problem from the uh, climate change, energy price, or uh, uh, air pollution in Singapore? Uh, uh, no, but the government uh, in general mm -hmm. gave some suggestions in, uh, at the national level about mm -hmm. this green plan. The government offer incentive, so oh. they start from the carrots. Mm -hmm. Because in Singapore, if they don't show the money, it will not work. Right? It's, it's a very capitalistic uh, kind of things. And most of the, the land, most of the building is, is under the private sectors, not mm -hmm. the government buildings. Mm -hmm. So the beginning is just simply uh, from our own initiatives. But we know about the incentives. So that's why when we, I start my uh, design studio this semester, I use the People's Park Complex. It's very old building, crumbling, architectural significance. But it's not under conservation because it's built on top of uh, MRT stations. So Urban Redevelopment Authority already put new GFA, 4.8. But the, mark, the color is green, it is, it's blue, it means commercial, but no conservation status. So my conservation unit is trying to convince URA by starting by asking my students in three first weeks to develop a digital twin using Refit or Archicad, not SketchUp, useless. SketchUp mm -hmm. is to convince your client quickly about your design idea, mm -hmm. but doesn't give you enough uh, potential to show the carbon footprint. So digital twin with GFA and everything, and the GFA actually is 6.8. Mm -hmm. And then we ask, why you are a put 4.2 instead of the existing one? I mean that I can point at the, our finger to ERA, you don't want to conserve this, okay? Mm -hmm. And second mm -hmm. is the, the, the functions, it's mixed use, so it can be used with anything. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not the initiative of government. The government sometimes needs some feedback mm -hmm. and criticism. And criticism by the academics is well received by the government. Mm -hmm. New ideas is well received by the government, including the fire regulation and so on. So we use our positions as the game changer. Mm -hmm. The government only able to convince uh, the lawmaker to extend, because the lease is now up only 44 years. Because it's already built since 1960, so it's already 50%. So the demolition is imminent. But if we put the protection, if the concrete can stand for another 100 years, why can't we reset the list to 19 years again? Mm -hmm. And that makes the carrot you know, sweeter for the developers. Mm -hmm. And second, you put four point something, but actually it's six point something. So you can say to the developer, this is the benefit, the, the incentive, if you want to keep. Okay. So we provide the government with ammunition with numbers, with visuals, because we can, after the studio, we can do an exhibition in URA gallery, and we can invite public, including the developers, show the numbers. So if the URA convinced that this is not shortchanging the developers, they will happily revise the color in the master plan. Okay. Right, so this is the way that we, we, we shame the government without make the government losing face. Because losing face is very damaging in this mm -hmm. society. If we shame the government by putting this into the newspaper, you know, and then they say like, oh, excuse me, the impact is very negative and they will stop this kind of nonsense, this stop of exercise, because you cannot criticize the government. Yeah, very really interesting. Mm -hmm. So you, you talk about uh, uh, the government a lot, okay. Uh, let me ask you about the people or the user of the building. What they expect this from? Uh, because uh, uh, the student go to NUS, they expect something uh, fancy building with high technology, but uh, they offer them with a very tropical climate buildings like that. For them at the beginning, of course, I, I, I told you, give it to year one student because they cannot protest. But after yeah. four years using that building, they fall in love. Uh -huh. So I saw uh, recently uh, three pre-wedding photos is taken uh, in our 
surrounding in the green space on the corridor and the upper floor. So all former students getting married and they always remember this is the coolest place to take wed pre-wedding photo. Mm. I mean, because it's minimalist, it's very contemporary. So the, the community is, is uh, I think it starts from this youth, they accept this. Mm. But second, I have another uh, unit, uh, Baba House. Uh, in downtown, a former shop house, and now is used as a museum for Pranakan culture. Mm. So I work together with the Solar Panel Research Institute, series of NUS. We produce uh, Pranakan solar panels with motifs, with blues, with all these colors. And we want to install on the back lane, vertical, not horizontal. Oh. And in Singapore, you, you have to preserve the front part, it's concept shop house, but at the back, you can do some changes, additional GFA. So we use this new part first. And we want to show everyone it's possible, actually, to reduce the electrical bill by 30%. Not zero, OK? 30% is enough. And if you translate it into dollars, ordinary household, it can easily say you save you every month about 500 to $600 to show the money. So once the plan is, once is the number is come out, we able to show this to the public. URA is willing to suggest to 20 shop house owners to do the experiments. And they give us money to do the research. So it's a research project. Yeah? And if we can convince them that they can have $600 reductions, even more, I think they will buy this. And when they buy this, and we, invest, uh, we, we call Channels New Asia, and we put this in the in the, uh, straight times, I think the ball the ball will start rolling. So the ambition is really to 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 move towards the the shop houses. We have around eight thousand shop houses for various functions, and it's possible to bring down the energy a little bit, and the. Solar panel uh, research center are willing to try not just vertical prana control panel, but roof tiles. That look like roof tiles with efficiency between 70 to 80 percent compared to the white solar panel, but it's still all right. But the biggest challenge from coming from the land authority, you know why? Because this on the back lane, protruding 20 centimeters, is protruding into state land. So we need to get permissions to use that for 10 or 20 years. Okay? And second, the fire departments. Because it's playing with fire, and you put on the roof of the heritage building. And third is URA, the National Heritage Board. Why? Because we, you need to punch the wall for the equipment. But again, our argument is we are academic institutions. This museum is academic museums. And the benefit is much bigger if we can do this and prove this. So the next meeting is with these several authorities, energy authorities, development authorities, BCA, together, sit uh, next week after I return from, from Bangkok, and we will negotiate with them. Well, um, I'm interested in the way that architect uh, refer to the traditional vernacular architectures. Uh, and, and adapt that kind of typology for uh, this e educational building. Uh, if you would compare this new building to the old building uh, in terms of learning, um, I mean, for students, uh, was it any big change in? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Of course, well, using this auditorium, we cannot just do this speech in uh, that vernacular house, right? Because the usage is not for auditorium. If so example, like the tall buildings, the argument is how can it possible without aircon? Because if you open the window, the wind is very strong. But Woha, 20 or 30 years ago, has designed a so called the, the monsoon window for high rise building. Monsoon window is very simple. You have this glass, but you recess this crown, uh, the, the, the the lower part, about 30 centimeters inside. And then you put grill. So you can close your door, your window during the storm, 
and you can control the opening of this vertical one and the wind will flow. So if your apartment is quite shallow and you have another openings there, then you can create this cross ventilations even if you are on the 60 or 50 floor. It works. It's just a matter of, you know, uh, retranslations for the new uh, usage. Because in the past, we don't have classroom. Even if you have classroom, say, in, uh, in uh, a public hall, in a sala or whatever, the scale is smaller. But if you need to do something like auditorium for 100 people, the vernacular architect doesn't have the answer. But now we have the technology, we have the materials and so on. But you need to do is to do a simple carbon calculator how much embodied carbon is existed in the existing building. And we you do adaptive reuse, what kind of material choice that can lower the carbon calculations. Yeah. So you talk, you start to talk about a carbon calculation. Uh, is this uh, in the curriculum for architecture students to calculate the carbon footprint of building construction? Yes. So one of my PA, or well, not me, but uh, PhD students at NUS under the Sustainable Design developed a simplified carbon calculator. So they produce a table based on the PCA requirements and international requirements based on typology. For example, for sleeping room, uh, for say, meeting room, what is the number, what is the number, and so on. And then they produce a very simple one-page spreadsheet. The students can just input the number of the existing and additional, and then they will show the, the graph, whether it's going up or going down or whatever. And I asked these uh, PhD students to, to share the carbon calculator for students. So this being back to the choice of building material, because in European country, you see people use timber because it's a, like a low carbon material. But how about Singapore? You prefer that? Or? For in Singapore, officially, if you have an old shop house with timber, you are extempted for changing it to changing it to, to concrete. But according to regulation, if you renovate, as for building permission, you have to change that floor into concrete. Because timber is considered as um, dangerous for fire. The fire rating is very low. Even examples, uh, our students doing uh, rebuilding in, uh, in, uh, in an island. And there's a timber structure. And then the, the building authority doesn't give approval. They say you have to change to steel. And they say no. <laughs> I'd like to pause the talk show for a minute and give the audience a chance to ask our three panelists questions. Who has questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. Isn't your idea of eliminating lifts, eliminating skyscrapers? I'm thinking of Singapore with her beautiful skyscrapers. Aren't you eliminating that? What does the government say about that? Well, we are not eliminating leaves. We are hiding leaves. <laughs> because there is a rules about the universal accessibility, right? So people with wheelchair should be able to reach the top. Firemen have to be able to go to the top as well. So we are hiding the leaf and trying to discourage people if there is an alternative for the leaves. And second question, the question against the high-rise building. Is it a need, the necessary to build a high-rise building? Right? So, is it just for what? Is it what you want or is it what you need in terms of the urban development? And that could be the next questions we ask to the government as an academics. If you still have the possibility to densify the intensity on the lower, middle, lower building, you don't need to do that. And it just show the carbon calculator on the urban level. And that could be an academic paper on that. Brian, you had a question. Yes. For those of us here, like myself, who are not architects, uh, wonder if um, Professor Widodo, you would be able to help us understand a little bit better about how 
the cooling and ventilation of air works in this system because everything depends on that. I, for, for example, it, it, you, so what you have is the air conditioners are putting out air at 27, 28 degrees, the fan blows it down, and then the windows are open, right? Normally we close our windows when we use our air conditioners. Closed. Oh, they're but closed. There is nostrils. There is uh, opening gaps okay. between frames. Okay, and you say that the, then the air flows out. Yes, because of the pressure from okay. the fan. So then if it just keeps flowing out, don't you run out of air? What, what brings air in? From the aircon. Oh, the aircon is, is yes. bringing in, yes. air in from outside? Cooler, slightly cooler, because outside is around 32, 30 degrees. Right. And then you cool down the, the air a little bit, it's become 28. Right. So only you need to bring down about 5 degrees. It does not consume energy too much All right. in the chiller. Right. And then you have constant flow of air from that chiller, 28. And then there is a fan that okay. creates this cross ventilation on your body. Okay. But what you feel is like 25. Ah. The ambient temperature is 25. But if you bring a uh, thermometer, it will show 28. I see. So the intake of air is through the chiller? Yes. From outside? From the old buildings. From the old buildings, okay. So we and don't build a new chiller. Okay, but the, but the air itself, where it, where's the air intake in the chiller? Yes, fresh air. But it comes from, from outside from, the building? Yeah, from the whole, yeah, from outside. Okay, and how big are these uh, nostrils or gaps in the windows or? Two centimeters ah. around the buildings. Ah, okay. Sometimes also the gaps on the corners, they ah. cannot be seen. Okay, that's interesting, thank you. <laughs> I have a question myself for our two Thai architects here. If you want to implement a, a program like this here in Thailand, how do we go about it, and what are the obstacles? <laughs> yes, uh, I would say that uh, we have to uh, control the exterior of the building. We have to build more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have to adjust the microclimate of the building. Put more tree, have some evaporation, uh, have ventilation. And then we start to think about energy saving using a passive design like that. Yeah. So you have to okay adjust. You have to change the the surrounding of your building first. Yeah, I think so. So I think first of all we need to adjust the mindset of the student, as <laughs> Professor Vidado suggests. Uh, I think we, we need to learn more from the existing typologies in, in our cultures, not in terms of the essence, but in terms of how it works, uh, and adjust that to uh, the new contemporary building. Maybe we, we need to do that before uh, having a new regulation. I mean, uh, maybe push the student to, to try to experiment more. I think yeah. on that note, it's important for teachers, lecturers in history of architecture modules, not just talking about styles, but ask the student in one of the assignment to build digital models of traditional building in, and from Sukhothai, or from Ayutthaya, or whatever, or even this building. Ask them to calculate the carbon and the climatic performance by, uh, say, wind tunnel or whatever. There is a lot of software, actually, to test that one. Make them convinced with that. And then, with that learning lessons, the, the history and theory of architecture modules is become more exciting and applicable to studio. Not just for the sake of aesthetics, history, and whatever. That is important, but that is the topping, the icing of the pizza. Momo, you had a question. Yes, uh, in connecting to the last question, it's a, um, I think usually those kind of the energy saving buildings have a more initial investment. So it's uh, difficult to convince the owner or the developer. So in that case, maybe that because of the Singaporean uh, national 
uh, government policy, then the, the, the university authority may be convinced. But uh, how you prove that um, the investment and the recovering of that uh, energy saving, I mean, it is difficult. <laughs> that is one question. And the <laughs> can, second is, uh, I see that uh, the, the building design, the design briefing is quite complicated or is the whole process that you working together, including the students with the designer? Okay. Um, the, the second question, but actually it's complicated because we make it complicated. Because it's, uh, it looks that it's, it's like smart building, but actually this is no brainy. It's a year two students project in terms of form and programming, right? It's very simple. And second is about the, the, you know, how to, to convince Right, the the the, uh, the way we do it is actually is by uh, by doing it first pilot project because it's small building. It's only eight hundred eight thousand square meters inside the campus, but the publicity is important after that. So if you want to do it here, I think as I said, as I suggested before, the, the main hall of the Siam Society can be one example. If in the, there is a, a Tamasat campus, uh, one of the canteen or even say whatever existing building converted into that, that doesn't require a lot of, of effort and struggle. But the publicity after that is important. That can generate more interest. The more difficult part, of course, after that, then you have to confer this building, right? This tower. <laughs> How to change this aircon system and so on. But it will be easier to convince the, the, the board of director to spend more money to transfer this one. Start from one room first and then do the mock-up and maybe work together with the academics as an academic exercise and produce several alternative model iterations. The students got the grade, the, grade the, the, the staff got paper published in Scopus, the points. <laughs> then Simon Society have uh, 10 alternative free design. Wina, you have a question. <laughs> yeah, sure. Just uh, two quick ones. One, um, I came a little late, and you started talking about the uh, strategy that Lee Kuan Yew laid out probably 60-odd years ago now um, on, on um, making this Singapore right now city in nature, right? Mm. Of course, after Lee Kuan Yew's passing, and um, this is more slightly more political, um, this is not really a competing um, party against <laughs> the yeah. current government. So what pressure is there to maintain that strategy um, going forward? That, that question. Uh, money. Because Singapore emit a lot of carbon. Because everything has to be imported. Every chicken, every beef that we eat, even every veggies, is producing carbon footprint. Therefore, government need to offset that on the international level, on the carbon trading. So therefore, by reducing this, we want to get some additional incentive from the international market that can be traded. So the process is really about economy. And nowadays, if you don't do this, we are left and become the paria in terms of the world economy. And I guess the second question I have is maybe slightly outside this topic a bit. I'm always an interesting architecture. I'm not an architect by training. Um, I had worked for a real estate company, and we had, um, in, in that capacity, I had looked into what can be done in terms of um, using nature solutions for building um, shopping malls. And there was a really interesting one, I'm sure you must have heard of it, in Harare in Zimbabwe. Does that, uh, that technology that they use, which I understand doesn't even use air conditioning, it uses natural airflow. Would that work in the context of countries like Thailand, you know, with in, in Southeast Asia? This is the expert. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess Zimbabwe, right? It's in hot and it's not very humid, right? Okay. Yeah, I would say that, okay, pesticide for hot, dry climate is maybe easier than hot and humid climate like Thailand. Because uh, when you spray water, you add some water, you have really cool and more humid air. That's close to the 
to the comfort. So I, I would not suggest using that in Bangkok because you're going to get some mold and mildew everywhere. Yeah. So that's just some uh, example. Okay. In Singapore, it's extremely humid. It's very similar like this. Yeah. And the answer in SDE4, again, related to your question, is, is, is the chiller. The old chiller is the one who reduced the humidity and the air is blowing up into the, the room. So we breathe a less humid air and slightly cooler. And then with the age of the fan and cross ventilations, you have the comfortable levels of humidity and uh, ambient temperature. So I think to, to convince it's very easy, just organize a study trip. And having bring been, key people from industry, government. Having had the benefit of a tour of this building, yes. seeing is believing. <laughs> so the SAM Society will be doing a tour to Singapore, yeah. which will feature this building. Um, time is moving on, and I wonder if our panelists have any final remarks they'd like to make. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that you show us some real data of the performance of the buildings. When I look at the uh, energy use, okay, it's very really good compared to our school. Our school use like a three times of your school. So it looks like we have to do something. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> it's very inspiring. Thank you so much. Well, I think uh, one of the things we learned from the case is that uh, educational building in, in university can be a testing ground for um, for, for future development. I mean, normally government uh, allow any building in the university to, to do whatever they want, but on the other hand, it, we can look uh, in the other way and turn the building in the campus into something um, that can be experiment. Uh, it could be in a positive way or a negative way, but I think uh, today we learn from uh, this case in particular. I think that's it. Yeah, for me it's very simple, just walk the talk. Start from something small, but it's doable, and then convince everyone that it works. If you don't convince, then what else can be done? Hopefully our children will have an open mindset, especially from the university. And as a parents, each of us also play our role to educate our children that uh, going out, walking, sitting under the trees, it's much more convenient and comfortable rather than to lock up yourself inside the, the rooms with your gadget. So the idea of Siam Society doing a walking tour in Bangkok <laughs> for primary, secondary school kids, it could be a, a starter. And then ask them to have a lunch in an open sala somewhere near the river. So make them fall in love again to nature. Right, so, Thank you. I'd like to yeah. ask Ajahn Yong Tanit um, to say a few remarks in closing. Ajahn Yong Tanit straddles our two organizations. He is a prominent leader of the Association of Siamese Architects. He is also a senior advisor to the Siam Society. Ajahn. Thank you, Kim, and the thanks, Professor Vidodo, for accepting the uh, um, the, the talk um, this afternoon and the, um, as I know both uh, organizations like uh, CM Society and also the um, Association of Siamese Architects under Royal Patronage the, the, um, uh, it's been I, I think quite uh, at first when we had the idea when Kunjim has uh, had the idea of uh, Bridging to organizations to have uh, a, a, a public lecture is quite challenging for me because it's. Uh, I think for this lecture is quite. Um, I, uh, it's. It's. Um, we didn't have um, much time for the preparation, so. Um, but uh, we did it, and the. I'd like to thank uh, also Professor Winyu and Professor Art. Uh, uh, I even didn't contact two professors directly, but the, um, uh, through some connections and also um, uh, a talk uh, with uh, some um, 
administrative members of the um, Association of Siamese Architects. Uh, so uh, that makes uh, this lecture possible. And the other thing that I think that would be great for the audience and for Siam society, that we are heading towards the net zero, right? Um, if, uh, I think if we can do, uh, uh, through my connections, uh, we can do something um, uh, under this uh, mega trend theme, uh, especially the um, in Thailand, um, uh, tourism is quite um, prominent, and the um, we are doing something what we call the uh, carbon neutral tourism, and it's still a very close group, and but it has an impact I think through all sectors, both in um, ac um, in academic and also in in indust you know, industrial sectors. Um, let's see and give your voice to the Siam Society or Jim or even to me that if you are interested in the um, we have we have the program under the National Research Fund uh, on the promoting and working on carbon neutral tourism not yet the net zero that was I think in the fifth years uh, in the future but this time if you have uh, interest on this, just let me know, and I think uh, probably we could do something because we have been started this project, uh, this a long program with many universities. Uh, I think this is the beginning of the third year, and we have the calculation and the uh, product category rules for tourism already with the Thailand uh, green uh, uh, greenhouse gas organization. So uh, I think uh, uh, we can do some updates also. And the tourism industry is so huge in Thailand. If, if we don't start right now, I think we're going to have a disaster in the future. Uh, so and yeah, the, lastly, I'd like to thank Professor Widodo again for coming and hope to welcome you again <laughs> uh, and see the development of, the, um, uh, of, of your school. And thanks for attending you and also Chan Art for uh, coming to have a discussion and talk. And, and thanks for the Am Society for giving us this very beautiful opportunity to have uh, our three professors uh, um, in, um, for this evening. Thank, thank you so much. I hope this can be perhaps the beginning of collaboration between the Siam Society and the Association of Siamese Architects on projects of this sort. And now on behalf of the Siam Society, I would like to present a token of our appreciation to our three speakers.